But when you look at life in the Middle East, the life for women is the most difficult. Joanne Doyle has a huge heart for these women. She's the director of Not Forgotten's Women's Ministry with E3 Partners, and she's here to tell us about the great work that you are doing there. Hi, Cheryl. Thanks so much for coming. Thank you. Now, you were a woman who wasn't necessarily passionate about ministering to Muslim women. Tell me about what changed in your heart. Right. I wasn't. We were going to the Middle East a lot and I was working with my husband and we would work with groups of, you know, former Muslims or, you know, Christians that were in that Islamic culture. And I would see Muslim women and honestly, when I would see them veiled, I would not be drawn to them. And I was a little intimidated, maybe borderline afraid of them, didn't understand them. And then as our ministry continued to grow, I got to know more and more of these former Muslim women. And so what happened is I began hearing some of their stories of what happened to them in their life. My heart started breaking. For instance, I was talking to a woman one time, former Muslim, she's now a believer, husband is still a Muslim. And every time we talked through an interpreter, of course, every time we talked, um, she would look at me, but when I would talk, she kept turning her head like this. And finally I said to the translator, why does she keep doing that? She goes, oh, you know, her husband's still Muslim and he stuck metal in her ear. And so she's deaf in that one side. So she turns so that she can hear you. And I thought he stuck metal in her ear and she's deaf. And so as I started hearing more of these stories about what life is like for Muslim women, my heart just broke for them. And as it broke, then God's love flooded in. And all of a sudden I had this compassion and this compellingness and this urgency to reach out to them with the love of Jesus. So what is life like for a woman in the Middle East? What are the challenges? Right. Okay, well, the Middle East, as you know, is a different world paradigm. They're based on honor and shame. So if something happens to a woman or she does something, that can bring dishonor to her family. So let's say a young woman is molested or raped or something horrible happens to her along those lines and her family finds out about it. Well, it doesn't just influence her, it affects her whole family. So how you bring, how you restore honor is by getting rid of the evidence. So oftentimes this girl will be beaten and abused by her family or oftentimes even killed because now that the evidence is gone, honor is restored to the family. So honor killings are sadly still alive and well in the Middle East. So now you work both in the Middle East and here in the West. Right. Tell me about those two different ministries. Right. So over there, you know, we reach out to Muslims and former Muslims. We work a lot with the Syrian refugees right now, and they are so desperate and so brokenhearted. And because a woman's voice is silenced and she has no one to be her advocate, and bad things happen to women in the Middle East, they tend to hide everything in their heart. So especially when they come to faith in Christ, we want to see them live the abundant life. And so we seek to be um, kind of their voice and give them the freedom to share what they've hidden in their heart so that when it comes out into the light, they can be healed and set free and continue to love Jesus and walk with him if they're a believer, or also to pass that on to others so that they too can be f set free in their society. And one thing that we do, Cheryl, that is so amazing is we wash the women's feet. Mm. And when we do that, it is amazing how God just rushes in, shows them that he loves them and he begins breaking down that wall that they've put around their heart to protect them, breaks that wall down so that they can really know him freely. Then on our American side, um, we kind of have a saying around our office that the Muslims are coming, the Muslims are coming, the Muslims are here. And so you don't have to go across the ocean to minister to Muslims, you can do it right here in your own home. And so we are trying to encourage American women and men both to reach out to the Muslims around them. Um, I think because of all the terrorism that we've seen, that we even as believers, not just as a society as whole, but as believers are afraid or even hate Muslims. So we tend to shy away from them. And I know I used to be this way. If I would see a Muslim woman in the grocery store, I didn't quite know what to make you know, of her. So I'd kind of go the other direction. Now it's my goal to say, no, don't reinforce the lie that they're invisible and that they don't matter. Show them that you see them. When you see a Muslim woman, give them eye contact reach out to them, try to have a conversation with them, you develop a friendship with them. You may be the one that can bring them to faith in Christ. You almost think that it would be tougher for women here in the West because there's so much now racism and a reaction against the terrorism that we've seen. Right. Paris and California and various places around the world mm -hmm. so that coming here would be even more isolating. They would feel even right. more lonely because a, they're trying to adapt to a different language, a different culture, a different mm -hmm. lifestyle. They, they don't fit in like they did before and the people are hostile to them and right. they've lost everything. 
you know, if they're refugees. Exactly. So it, it must be unimaginable for many of these people. You know, it is. And, I, you know, can I just tell you one story? I was at Pottery Barn Kids, and they have story hour there. And I was there with my grandchildren, and I saw all the mothers clustered together talking. And then there was this one Muslim woman, you know, wearing her hijab, sitting all by herself. No one's interacting with her. No one's talking with her just because of what you're saying. No one knows what to make with her, so she's isolated. And then I looked and I saw all the little kids clustered together and I'm looking for the two little dark-headed kids and sure enough, there's little brother and sister, again, sitting all off by themselves. So I could not wait for that story hour to be over so that I could go and talk to this woman. And as soon as I did, I made a beeline over to her and I you know, asked her how she was doing and what her name was and where she was from. And we talked for maybe 15 minutes. Do you know what she said to me, Cheryl, at the end of our conversation? She said, Joanne, I want you to know that I will never forget your name for the rest of my life. I'll never forget your name for the rest of my life because she's so used to being ignored and overlooked and has no American friends, totally ostracized. You see this with just refugees and immigrants as well from any mm -hmm. country in the world trying to make friends with Canadians or Americans, with yes. the country that, you know, is, is the hardest thing for them to break into. They, they don't speak English very well. You know, um, it's really, you just get isolated in your own little world, your ESL classes, everything like that. I remember having, Christmas dinner, making Christmas dinner for a group of refugees mm -hmm. one Christmas and hearing all their stories and talking to them. And for me, it was one of the best Christmases of my life. And they were just so thrilled that someone took an interest in them. Mm, good for you for doing that. I'm sure that we'll never forget it. Yeah, absolutely. So for, for people who are watching this, what do they need to know about how to bridge that divide? Because I think beyond the terrorism piece that we see in the news, mm -hmm. Just in life, if you don't know about something, if you're not familiar with something, and that could be from someone with a disability to right. somebody from another country or a different language mm -hmm. or culture, you know, it's like, it's scary. You, you don't, you're intimidated. You don't necessarily know how to talk to that person or bridge that divide. How do we, how do we bridge that, face that in our own hearts? Right. That's a really good question. And I think that you're right, education, really does help us and we need to look beyond just what we see on the news of what's happening in the world especially with terrorism and islam because most muslims are not terrorists most muslims are not trying to kill anyone they just want to live a great life raise their children feed them educate them that kind of thing so if you have that in the back of your mind i think that will help and read some things read some christian literature on how god is reaching out to muslims as you know my husband's written a couple books on that got to give him a little plug but um, <laughs> you know that that's a great place to start. Read some books on what God is doing. And then I would just encourage people to, sh again, show these Muslims that you see them. Befriend them like you would anyone else. You mentioned people in a wheelchair. Don't you know that they too are overlooked? We don't want to stare, so then we ignore them. And they see that, and they know that, and that does make them feel isolated. So the same thing. If you see a veiled woman, smile at her, make eye contact. If you have the opportunity, just say hello. You know, ask them what country they're from. Mm -hmm. We always say if a Muslim moves in next door to you, don't call the police. <laughs> you bring over cookies or brownies and get to know them. You may be the one as a believer that can befriend them and bring them to faith in Christ. I, I love that. And your work is not just here in North America, but you also do work overseas. And recently you had the chance to minister to the mothers and the wives of 21 Egyptian men who were killed in Libya on the beach. We all saw those pictures mm -hmm. of them with their hands behind their back. They were beheaded. It was a horrifying story. Tell me about the women left behind. Yeah, oh my gosh. I wish you could have been with us, Cheryl. It was incredible to meet these precious, the wives, the widows, there some of their children, the mothers. Their faith is deep and it's amazing. A lot of people have asked us, do you think those men, they were Coptic Christians, do you think they were believers? And my answer, my husband's answer is absolutely. They were willing to die for Jesus. Yes, they knew him. First of all, to give you a little background, over a hundred men were captured and the men, these families are very, very poor. You know, dirt floors, no running water. So they were going to the oil fields of Libya to make money. And as they were coming back one time, over a hundred were captured. And they told them, ISIS told them, if you convert to Islam, we'll let you go. Well, most of them did. And so they were released, but the 21 would not bend their knee to Islam. And so they tortured them for 45 days. And then on that 45th day, they beheaded them. And to go into the homes of these people, these women, they knew Jesus. And some of them are illiterate, but they could tell us 
that Jesus loves the widow and that he's a father to the fatherless. They knew the word of God. And I'll never forget one mom said to me, she had four children, and she said, I made my children watch the video of their dad being beheaded. She said, because I wanted them to know that their father was like a lion. He was not willing to bend his knee. He loved Jesus so much that he went to death for Jesus like a lion. He was so brave. And I want your faith to be like your father's faith, that no matter what, you will never deny Christ. Is that not incredible? Mm. Um, These women were humble. They were passionate in their faith. Um, The women had a dignity about them, even though they were very poor. I will say the mothers, sadly, you can imagine, I can't imagine losing a child. Um, They were having a more difficult time Mm. um, processing through this. We are preparing to go back, which I'm excited to do this, and to bring the women out of their small villages into a bigger city and do some PTSD counseling with them and really discipling them in their faith and helping them to know more of the Word of God to work through the healing process of what they've gone through. It's so important that you're there. Well, thank you so much. I Mm. love the work that you're doing. We could could talk forever. I just, I love the fact that you're part of that story that we all watched in horror and that you're on the back end there helping to bring healing and recovery Mm. to those women. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Cheryl. It's been a blessing.